Welcome to my session on uh, managing Drupal 8 sites at scale. Uh, my name is Kevin Mall. I'm a Drupal architect at AppNovation Technologies. Uh, my handles are kmall at uh, drupal.org and github and uh, I'm Kevin J. Mall at Twitter. Um, so today some of the things I want to talk about are kind of what the needs of an enterprise organization are. Um, I really should rename this because it's really the needs of any organization of any size. Um, enterprise just makes it a little bit more difficult with the scale that we have. So um, we need a few different, to modify a few different things in order to uh, get things to work for us. I'm going to talk about a little bit about what Edison is um, and some of the tools that we use in Create. Um, and then uh, what I really want to do is uh, leave some time at the end to talk about open sourcing. Um, the company I work for is uh, very keen on open sourcing um, almost everything that we're able to. Um, so there's a few tools and things that we've created uh, that we've already open sourced. So I'll kind of discuss those and show you where those are. Uh, then there's a few tools and stuff that we're using that um, to be honest with you, we're not quite sure exactly how to open source it or how we want to. So uh, I'm hoping that maybe some of you guys here work in organizations that manage a lot of sites or big sites and, uh, you know, might have some ideas about, you know, the best way to open source those or, or even if some of the stuff we're doing would even be beneficial to you guys or to anybody else out there in the community. Um, because in the end, if, you know, if no one's going to use it but us, then... Um, kind of makes it a little bit difficult. So let's talk a little bit about the needs of an enterprise. And as I said, these are really just needs of an organization, right? For a website, you know, if you want a website, you need to set up some things. You need some GitHub repos, you need hosting, you need some other services. So that all takes a little bit of administration, a little bit of setup and maintenance. Um, you want consistency in your sites. Uh, if you have a hundred different Drupal sites, um, I can almost guarantee you that 80% of those sites are going to use the same functionality. So you don't want to do, use different things and different tools and different modules and different processes for something that in the end is ultimately the same functionality. You want to make sure that there's consistency along the way. Um, you want to make sure you have some element of testing. Um, in this day and age, it's pretty dangerous to deploy code out there without having some sort of automated tests um, or some sort of functional test to make sure that code that you're deploying actually works, um, doesn't break anything that used to work, um, things of that um, security as well. I mean, just about everything that you do on the web these days um, needs to be secure. There are people out there constantly trying to hack you. So you need to make sure that you have the things in place to make sure your site's secure. Um, and I think to me most importantly of all is, is a good developer experience. Um, you know, you need to make it easy for your developers to, to build features and to get your code out into your website so people can use these features. So, uh, so we've been working kind of within those constraints on um, this team um, that we've now called Edison. Um, Edison is uh, part of, is an engineering team at a large pharmaceutical company. And um, essentially we used to be called the platform team or platform engineering team. Uh, but we've kind of reapproached the way that we're looking at this with our D8 platform. Um, and we've kind of made it more into a product, more into a branding thing where we're actually building a product that people are going to be using to deploy their sites and to maintain their sites and to kind of see what's going on within their sites. So essentially it's just a group of tools and processes that we use to manage our sites. And it consists of uh, three main parts really. Um, Edison Base, Edison CD, which is our continuous delivery, and Edison Dashboard. So Edison Base is really what we kind of consider our platform. Um, we base this upon the Drupal Composer project. Um, if you're building sites on Drupal 8, chances are you're kind of, if you're using a Composer workflow, you're usually basing it off of your Drupal Composer uh, template. So this is kind of just our version. Um, it contains all of our custom and contributed modules. It contains all our files and configurations that we 
um, we want to deploy out that every single site is going to use. So whenever any site is built, it automatically pulls these modules, these files, these configurations. This is what really brings that consistent consistency into these sites. Um, uh, next is Edison CD, and that's just our continuous delivery system. So this is uh, mainly a tool written in Python. Um, it's essentially what we used uh, to do in Drupal 7 was a lot of bash scripts with Jenkins, and that was what we used to do a lot of our deployment and a lot of automation. Uh, we've since moved that out of that, and we've moved to Python, and um, we're currently using a tool, um, a CI tool called Iron.io. So that's our continuous delivery system, um, and it's also our main automation uh, tool. Uh, and the, the third part of it is the Edison dashboard. This is the main place for managing all of our sites. This is kind of the the UI that we've built that kind of integrates all of these services and all of these tools. Um, so this kind of gives the, the developer the ability to see um, what's happening, what sites they manage, what environments are in there, what's the status of these, did my build that I just sent to, uh, to our dev environment, did that pass? If not, why? Where can I get logs for why it didn't pass? Um, where can I see some of the testing results? I don't want to have to go to a million different services and log into a bunch of different places in order to see things. We kind of want everything in a consolidated place, easy to find, um, easy to see what's going on, laid out in a way that kind of makes sense to developers. So that kind of goes hand in hand with the good developer experience. Uh, it's also good for administrators. You know, this is where they, they can do a lot of things like create sites. Um, they can see reports, um, consolidated metrics on, you know, how many sites we have, how many builds are passing. You know, do we have an issue with some of these because all of a sudden 90% of our builds are failing. You know, things like that. We all, we want it all in kind of one consolidated place. So one of the big changes that we made when we went to Drupal 8 is we've kind of split up the way that our sites are made. Rather than having one you know, GitHub repo with, with your whole site and it custom code, contributed code, Drupal core, all in one place, we kind of split that up. And now we have what we call a site repository. And that's what the Drupal, our version anyways, of the Drupal Composer project makes. When you build a site, it pulls all of this stuff in. Custom code all goes in an installation profile. So it's a, it's a way to contain in one location all custom code configuration and things that are needed specifically for that site. So essentially the site repository is what contains the the main composer JSON file and the composer lock file. We make that read only to our vendors. Um, the way that we kind of structure this is we as the Edison team, we don't actually build websites. We build the base that people make uh, build websites on and then we hire different vendors for different brands and uh, different components of the business that need websites. So essentially we're not building any code so we need to make sure that we have some sort of controls in place where um, you know, an outside company can't come in and say, hey, um, we don't really want all these security modules here because it really hampers some of the stuff that we want to do and just rip it out, right? So they don't have the ability to do that the way we structure this. So essentially, we only give them access to the code that they need to use and alter, which is their custom code. So essentially, the, the main site with that composer JSON file pulls in our uh, Edison base, which is really just a PHP package, um, and it pulls in the installation profile, also a PHP uh, package. Um, so to build a site, you know, you can run your, sing your single um, composer, get uh, create project, get the site repo, and then your whole site gets built, the installation profile gets pulled in. So, just a few other things, so kind of to round out Edison, is be between, essentially it's the umbrella around all of the things that we need to kind of create and maintain these Drupal sites.
So obviously, you know, we're using this on Drupal 8. Composer is a huge part of our process. Um, and, and to me, it's been a really beneficial tool that's been added to our tool set with the advent of Drupal 8. Um, it allows us to do things like we were saying before, where we could kind of create most of the site repository the way we want and then just kind of limit the, the vector of which the vendors have to work with with their custom code into a single place. Um, we store all of our custom code on GitHub uh, and we expose that to Composer through private packagist. So if you guys aren't aware what private packagist is, it's essentially kind of a paid service from the guys who run packagist. Uh, and that allows you to put your, some of your custom code that you're not actually putting out in the open space, so if you, your private GitHub repos, things like that. It allows you to expose those to composers so you can use them, pull them in, just as you would with like an open source Drupal module. Um, so, you know, there was actually a conversation on Twitter where, you know, somebody was asking a colleague of mine kind of how we handle things like custom modules. And, and really, there, there's kind of two ways that we, we handle that. There's the custom modules that we make that we want included in, in kind of the base platform in Edison Base. Um, and then there's the custom modules that are going to be used by specifically just the vendors for like a one-off project. Um, so the way we do that is if it's going to be used by more than one project or all the projects, you know, we, we create a private GitHub repo and then through the private packagist, that gets exposed and we can pull that in. If it's just a custom module that a single vendor wants to use for a single site and there's not a lot of reusable potential there, um, then you can just put that module in the modules file in the installation profile. Um, then that gets pulled in when you pull in the installation profile into the site. So a lot of that just depends on kind of what it is and what it's used for. But uh, private packages has is, is really been huge for us because it allows us to kind of treat our, our own custom modules as if they were kind of op open source like Drupal modules out there on, on regular packages or any other PHP library. So it's a great tool. Uh, we also use Travis. You know, all of our testing runs through Travis, so anytime a developer makes a commit to the installation profile, uh, we run tests to make sure that you know, things are working. Uh, we run their, um, their PHP unit tests, which we require them to have. Uh, we, we run PHP code sniffer to make sure that you know, they're adhering to Drupal code and standards um, and, and things like that. We also use Rundeck as a, a task manager. This was actually a new, new one to me. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rundeck. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but I think it's an interesting tool and wanted to mention it. Um, it's a way, it's essentially a task runner. Um, and when I uh, kind of describe some of the functionality and some of the things that we do with the dashboard, I'll kind of, you know, a, a lot of that is kind of run on Rundeck and I'll kind of mention it there, but it's a really cool tool. And uh, our hosting is on Acquia. They, they host all of our sites, so all of our CI tools integrate with Acquia and with their uh, cloud API. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of some of the tools that we've created to handle some of the needs that I spoke about that we needed before. Um, so one of the main things is is setup and maintenance of sites, um, as well as consistency. So uh, we have a plugin for Composer that we've called Hydration. Essentially, uh, what this is is it's a package that provides a Composer script to be used as a placeholder replacement, mostly used by skeleton projects. So what does that mean, right? So everybody, for every site, you need a, a repository, right? Now, if you have 100 sites, or if you have 500 sites, or 1,000 sites, you need to be creating a lot of repositories. And, and to start doing that manually for every time you need a new site uh, gets a little tedious. Um, it's prone to error. You might miss some things. And do you really want to sit there and hit the Add New Repo button a 1,000 times in GitHub for every site that you need? Um, I certainly don't. So we've created a way with a, a composer plugin that you can set a, temp, a template for the repositories that you want. So we have a few different templates, one being for the site repository that I spoke about, 
and one being for the installation profile repository. So that essentially allows you to take a, a kind of a base skeleton repository. I don't know if you guys could see this in the back. This is where this might get a little tough with the resolution here, but essentially this is the outline of what would be a starter kit for a repository. You could put placeholders in the file names and within the files themselves. So, um, and then when you run this script, it's essentially going to take the placeholder and replace it with a variable that you pass in, which would ultimately be the name of the site. So it's going to replace all of these placeholders file names um, in every place within that file with the name of the site. And then once that's done, you have the resulting repository with everything that you need in it starting off as a base. So that, um, that gives us a way to ensure that everyone's starting with the exact things that they need um, and the exact things that we want them to have. So we've actually integrated this with our automation tool, um, which has an integration with our Edison dashboard. So you can just go into the dashboard and say, I want this site. Um, you know, for this one, we're using PFTest01. I type that in, hit enter. It calls out to our continuous delivery system. That would actually clone a repo, which is the template, runs our composer plugin, populates that, and then throws it to GitHub. So to, um, this is actually a plugin that a colleague of mine made, and it's, he's put it on the open uh, and open sourced it on GitHub. So you can require it in your project just by requiring the package name. Um, and I'll make these slides available, so if anyone's trying to write any of these down, um, I'll make sure I post this so you can have all the info. So the way this works is, and I don't know if you guys can see this at all. All right, I'm not going to try to mess with this too much, but essentially, <laughs> see, it's tough because it's, it doesn't seem to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, it's clearer on the video. Um, it's actually not even kind of clear here, but in presenter view, but essentially. Uh, it's just a section that you're adding into your composer uh, file that, that, that makes available to the plugin certain things. Um, and it, it, can, it passes in kind of some, some scripts here uh, or a command. And this is actually the command. Let me go here. So this is exactly the command that you run. So it's just a composer create project command. Um, you're passing it the URL of your private packagist, uh, or if you're just using all open source, you can pass it packagist. Um, and then the name and uh, the path to where you want this to go, which includes the name. So it takes the last bit of piece, which is the name of your site, and replaces all the, the placeholders in there. So essentially just loops through and replaces everything and then puts that code where it needs to be. So if you're creating, you know, hundreds and hundreds of sites, you can easily just loop through this and, and create all these GitHub repos. So the way we use it, as I mentioned before, is, you know, our continuous delivery system goes through, hydrates all of those repositories for any site that we pass to it, um, calling Composer to kind of do that work, and then we post it to GitHub. So it's a really quick and easy way to make sure that you have like a consistent way um, to build out sites. Everyone starts with exactly what you need them, uh, you know, you need them to start off with. So that's one of the kind of the, the, the more beneficial tools I think that we've made. Um, since we started putting that into practice, it's made kind of setup of this a lot easier to, to do. Um, so the next plugin that we use is a plugin called Paranoia. Um, so this is, is mainly for security. And what this is, is it's a plugin um, that will move all your PHP files out of your doc root. So this is the one that's actually been pulled into the Drupal Composer project uh, just a few months ago. Um, does anyone remember, I think it was 
few months ago, maybe a year ago, where there was a security vulnerability with the coder module, I think it was, where you didn't actually need the module enabled on your site for it to be vulnerable. Just having the, the file on the server made your site vulnerable to this hack, right? I see that look and that's, right? It's terrifying um, because you have a ton of modules that you know may not be used, especially when you're um, you know, in a situation like this where some of the modules that we include in our Edison base platform, they're not all required. You know, the good portion of them are, but some of them are just optional modules, but they get pulled into every single site. So if there's a vulnerability in one of these files that doesn't actually need to be um, enabled in order to execute, now we've got a security vulnerability on every single site. And yeah, it's frightening, especially uh, in this day and age with all the hacking attempts that are out there now. So this is a great and easy way to fix that. All this does is it runs on a composer post hook command and it just takes all your files out of the doc root and it puts them in a, in a folder outside the, the web root. Obviously sim linking back and forth so your, your web server thinks that they're all there so your site still works, everything's good. And what it does do is it leaves your assets that need to be there in, in the folder. So you know, essentially everything symlink, your assets are actually there. They're kind of exist in both places. Um, again, to, to, to require it, um, you just require it like you would any other package. Um, and this is kind of what you need to add in. I'm hoping you can see this a little bit more since it's a little bit less code up there. But essentially you're describing where your, your directories are and what you want them to be. So we actually put our app directory outside of the web root and that's where when composer runs it puts all of the code there um, you know like like you would here your Drupal modules go in module contrib modules your custom co code can go in certain places and then below there you'll notice you have Drupal app root and Drupal web root so you define your app root as app you define your web root we use doc root um, which is the standard Acquia uh, directory for their um, their web root and essentially the plugin will go and look for all your source code and then put sim links to your web root to make sure that there's actually no source code there um, and all your assets will be moved over as well so if you're developing this locally um, you can actually run these commands too so if you're adding a new file you can just add it to your um, to your app root like you would and you could kind of treat that app as where you develop um, and then say you add some, some theming uh, assets, some logos, some images, what have you. Uh, you could just run this command and it will actually automatically put those to where they need to go. So it's a very handy tool that, has, um, that we use on all of our sites now. Um, it's, it, it's relatively simple and easy to use. It doesn't require much configuration um, and it drastically increases the security of your site in my opinion so so again that's also open source that's been pulled into the Drupal Composer project so um, it is a separate package I think you do need to require it uh, specifically for that um, all right. so now I want to kind of talk about our dashboard um, this is kind of um, where I've spent a lot of my time over the past two years kind of working and figuring out, you know, how we want this to work and making it a better developer experience, um, make it easier to manage all of these sites and manage all the integrations with the different things that you have within the site. Um, unfortunately, I can't kind of go through a whole demo here, but um, what I plan to do is kind of show you some screenshots and uh, kind of explain to you how we've designed this and, and what the capabilities are. Um, and then um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, our thoughts in trying to open source this and seeing kind of what kind of needs you guys might have in working for other companies and, and, and some of the things that you've seen uh, and to see if this is kind of something that you guys think would be worthwhile to be in the open space. Um, I, I'm a little biased, but I think it's an awesome tool. So essentially this dashboard is a place where developers can go and kind of see a snapshot of everything that's happening. 
So on the screen here, I can e this is kind of the main site page. So I can see a lot of things from here. I can see what environments I have on the site. Um, and then I can see the status for a few different things for every environment, just at, at a quick look. Um, I can see when my last build ran. I can see who ran it. I can see if it passed or not. I can see when my tests ran. Did they pass? Who ran those tests? Um, there's also, I don't know if you can see, it's a little small. Uh, there's a log link there. So if your build failed, the next logical question is, why did it fail? Well, you can just click on that and it will actually open the log that we pulled in from our uh, CD system. Um, so you can actually go through the log and see what happened. You don't actually need access to our continuous delivery service to actually go in there and try to figure out what's going on. You can just click a link and, and know. Um, so that is the site there. Um, there's a few more things that, uh, that are kind of uh, cut off in the screenshot, but below here essentially would be, um, there's a few list of uh, views anyways that are just like builds. So you can see all the builds in kind of a different view. So um, not just the latest build, but all the builds that happened. Uh, also, during all of this too, we have uh, an event logging module where every time something happens, we fire events. We have this event uh, module that will actually log um, a lot of the you know things that will happen. Your build was kicked off, so we create an event. It's kind of like an audit trail that you can kind of go through. You can see what happened over time. Uh, you can actually search, go back, see kind of history of what happened. And so this is just a, we do have a kind of an information icon here. We're working on kind of making that a little bit more visible here, but um, certain things that you may need to know about your site here is where's our repository? Um, you know, so we have links here to your, the GitHub repository for the site and the profile. Um, there's also links to Travis. If you needed to actually go into Travis and see the testing results on this, you can do that. We do, um, we actually don't import the logs for Travis um, because there's not a lot of harm in giving people access. If you have access to the GitHub repo, you have access to it in Travis. So rather than importing that, we just kind of make links there. So those links for the Travis test actually will bring you to Travis so you can see the logs, see why your test broke, see what happened, so you can kind of troubleshoot it from there. So this is kind of the environment view. So you can step down and get a little bit more specific into your environment. So say you're, you know, you're working on a brand new feature, it's mostly in the development environment. You can kind of pull this up. And this gives you a little bit more information about that. You can kind of see the URL for this. Um, so you can kind of easily click there. You can see what version of the platform, which is what we call our Edison base. Uh, is it behind? You know, are you not on the latest version? You know, it, those are kind of all good things to know. Um, it gives you kind of some versions of some of the other um, other tools that we use, like the you know the scale version. So as I mentioned, the hydration scale comes from a specific repository. If we want to update, say, some of the configurations that we want to store at a baseline level, we can update that scale repository and then you know, repopulate the, the repository with these, new, um, with these new configuration files or settings or whatever we want to add. So that's version just like anything else. So we can kind of see exactly where that is. So we can know as much information about our environment and the way it was built as we possibly can. Uh, we also have um, some information here. Um, we have a kind of a, a connector module that we use that gets installed on all of our clients. And that's essentially integration to an API within our dashboard. That gives us the ability to kind of go out to these sites and get information from them. Um, we can see what, kind of, what modules are installed. We can you know, get system level information, PHP values. We can see what our memory li limit is. Um, we can see all kinds of things. Essentially anything you want to know about your site um, you can put in the module and then it can send back to here and it records it on the site. So it's a really handy tool for really knowing everything about what you need to know about your sites and your environments all in one place. 
Uh, it also lets you build your site. Um, we do have features where if you make a commit to a branch um, that has an environment on your repository, we'll build that automatically. Um, but not everybody has that. Say there's a project manager who is managing kind of releases and um, they're not actually committing, but they're, you know, they want to, they know something's there. They want to rebuild the site for some reason. Um, they can go into the dashboard here and, um, you know, fill in the, the defaults are usually fine. Um, and you click trigger build and it will go out to our CD system and it will build the site. Um, one thing I do want to note is that we've kind of built this all in a way that it, it's all pluggable. Um, we've really utilized the plugin system in Drupal 8 um, as much as we can because the way we saw it is, you know, a lot of these things, regardless of where you're hosting and what your CD system is, there's certain baseline functionality that you need in a tool like this. You need to know what sites are. You need to know, uh, you need to be able to build your site, things like that. But, you know, who builds your site doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters to us and it matters to you, but like, if you use somebody different, that's fine. You still need to build a site. So we've built that framework around that, and everything here is a plugin. So we've created a plugin for our CD system, or our Edison CD tool, um, that requires certain things to send a build. So say you want to use a different tool, um, you know, Circle CI. You've got your own CD. You want to use any continuous integration system in here, then you don't have to kind of write everything from scratch. You can just, um, you know, write a plugin that exposes just the things that you need to build your site and that integrates all into this form. And you can just kind of send, send builds from here. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have a connector module in all of our sites um, where we can go out and we can fetch data. Those are also all plugins. You need to fetch a different type of data from your site. You create a plugin for the dashboard. You create a, um, uh, a plugin for the client module. Um, and then you have that communication. Um, you know, you can pull that data from here. Where you store this data is actually pluggable. Right now, like certain things we store on entities in Drupal. Uh, certain things we're going to store in S3. Certain things we're going to send to other places. So where that data is actually stored can be defined as a plugin. So any information that you want to pull out from your environments and from your site to give you a better idea of what's happening and what the state of these sites are, you can get that information from here. Um, and uh, We do have automated processes that, that fetch it on a schedule, um, but if you know that there's something changed and you want to get an up uh, refreshed look at how everything is, you can just go to the dashboard and click a button and pull out all the information you need. Uh, you can also run tasks from here, and tasks, um, for the most part, are kind of drush commands that, that we want to allow vendors to run. We don't necessarily want to give uh, drush access to, to these sites. We don't want to, we really want to limit access as much as we can. Um, so this is where that run deck uh, implementation comes in. Run deck is actually just a task runner. So we can define a bunch of different jobs in Rundeck and pass it variables, and then Rundeck will actually go and run all of the, our stuff. So if we want to um, say, all right, you can clear cache from the dashboard, you know, they can do that. Um, this is a development environment, so I want them to be able to say, all right, we just completely screwed this whole site. Let's just start over, run a site install, start from scratch. You can do that. Um, we use Drupal-based permission, so obviously we don't allow them to do that in production. That would be a very bad idea if a developer accidentally reinstalled their site. Um, so there's just ways that we can um, enhance the developer experience, give developers the tools and the ability to do the tasks that they need to do to make their job easier, but we can kind of limit the amount of things that we give access to, and we can limit that access that they have so they can't inadvertently do something that would be bad. Um, so essentially, I mean, I wish I had a demo I could run through, but um, hopefully you got kind of a good idea of you know what we've built here and, and where we've run into. Um, 
and I think we've we've left a good amount of time and that was really on purpose because I kind of want to kind of open it up to a discussion and, and for sure if you guys have any questions about any of the things I've talked about um, we, we can ask that and um, before I do that though I just so a lot of those things that you saw like some of them are very specific to us uh, we as I mentioned we tried to build this in a way that's as generic as possible and build a framework around the things that you need to manage sites um, and then make everything beyond that a plugin so that you can write a plugin that is actually for your specific needs and then use it that way um, you know the problem with this is, in open sourcing this is uh, and we've had a lot of discussions in our internal team about how we want to do this and we don't really have a great plan because this isn't just like a module where you install it and be like hey install this cool thing and in five minutes you're going to be managing you know thousands of sites you're going to be you know it requires some configuration it requires some a plan to actually work it into how how you're managing your sites so um, there are certainly little bits and pieces that we could pull out if that was deemed kind of the most uh, beneficial thing to the community is to pull out bits and pieces of this but I mean essentially what we want to do is we feel we built a lot of really cool tools they're working very well for us um, as we were kind of bringing more sites on board um, you know as we were building these tools we kind of let a few sites in to kind of uh, what we call a pilot phase so we could test out a lot of these features we could see what works what doesn't you know what brings value what doesn't you know just because we think it's cool doesn't mean that it actually is going to benefit end users um, or you know the business who's actually wants the site right so um, as we build bring more and more of these sites on you know the system's getting stronger we're getting more confident in, in the way we've architected this um, and now we're kind of trying to figure out how we can give all this work and uh, effort and things that we've built into this and kind of put it out there for people to use. So that's kind of where, what I want to start the discussion off with. If, if people have questions, feel free to ask them. If people have suggestions on like, you know, say, hey, that sounds really cool. I would actually like to use that. Then like, I'd love to know about that. So. Yeah, actually, about the, that looks really awesome. Um, one thing I'm wondering about for the site management component, uh, when you start this, I'm wondering if you consider using Acre for that, and if not, why not? Because it does a lot of this. <laughs> so it just looks like, I'm just wondering why, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, um, at least amongst me and the people I work with, it wasn't necessarily a consideration, um, mainly because, I mean, to be, I know a little bit about Acre. I've never actually gone through and used it. Um, but essentially, I mean, we have a lot of the hosting, like things all done. We host an Aquia, like that's not going to change. Um, a lot of the things, and, and maybe it was just our view of it, but like we kind of thought that Aegra was really that other side of like, all right, well, we're going to host here. This is how we're going to do this. Whereas we already had a lot of these tools and these build processes. And this is kind of just like an, a UI that, that kind of fits on top of the tools that we need. Um, we also, at being a large organization, there's there's a lot of stuff that I don't see and I don't know about um, in what they can use and, and how they have to structure for compliance and certain things. So uh, I'm not sure like a fully open source hosting system end to end is, is something they considered, I'm not sure. Um, but essentially, um, we kind of had certain criteria that we already had, and that's what we had to deal with. And then we kind of built beyond that. Right, so just so, adding on to what was already there, basically, like, kind of like... Yeah, uh, kind of... Well, it's, a, it's a different target, you know. Yeah, like, we... The focus on the UI layer gives you more freedom, because, like, I, I am an Agar developer, but it is a monolith. Like, you get it all or nothing, and it's like, they all, all depends on it to each other. So by focusing on this layer, I can see how, you know, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Like tying yeah. everything together, the things you've already had, you're sort of... Yeah, and that's it, you know, and like I said, like, like Agar, I mean, to me, just personally, when I think of Agar, I think, all right, like, I have my own hosting here. Well, like, we host with Aquia, and like, that's not going to change. 
not anytime soon anyways. So it's not like we could rip that all out and be like, oh, well, we have Agar. We can just do, do all of this. Like, it was not going to happen, unfortunately. But we did need certain tools. And, and this thing has kind of grown into what it is now, right? Like, it started off with just a way to say, hey, here's a reporting tool. You know, we pointed our GitHub webhooks and our Travis hooks at this so we can report. But, and then over time, it, it just kind of built as we needed certain functionality so i mean I, I i was talking to john earlier and like this is kind of one of the things that i want to like bring up and discuss especially with you guys who have this experience right it's like agar is this monolithic thing right like I, as far as i know you can't really separate out some of these things you can't take components of it and say i don't want the hosting part and correct me if i'm wrong if that's like Every, if, if you're like, oh, we've already, you could do that, no problem. You know, like that is just my, my look at it. Um, you know, if there's components of this that would enhance your project, that's what I want to talk about, right? Like, that's where I want to say, hey, like, because I don't, like, the reason we haven't just gone out and say, hey, here's an installation profile for this management tool, like, go for it, is because we've actually tried that. Not me personally, but other members of our team did that with Drupal 7. And they put a lot of time and effort into building out these tools and they put it out there and like nobody wanted it, right? <laughs> it's like they... What um, that called? It's called Workflow Tools. Uh-huh. Yeah. Dave, and, Dave Paul. Yeah. And, and I, 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 I work with Dave, um, so this you know, on... Kind of yeah. And, and I talked to him about this, and, you know, and, um, and, and essentially like when we were talking about this, that's kind of what, you know... The, the, the thing was, we put a, a lot of time and effort thinking, we did this, everyone's going to want this, it's cool, and then, like, it kind of fell on deaf ears, right? So, we didn't want to do that, right? Like, I, I, I love contributing to open source. I love, whenever I can commit code back, I, I really enjoy doing so. I don't want to waste my time. If I'm gonna like spend time doing something, I want it to be impactful. I want, I want, it, to, I want it to bring value. So that's why rather than just doing that, we're taking this approach, and this is kind of the first step. I'm essentially here to kick tires and to kind of give you guys a glimpse at some of the things we're doing and to say, hey, we, we, we don't want that, that, or that, but we could use that, right? Like, how can we get that part of it? And that's kind of what, like I said, no one's gonna just take this and drop, no one's gonna take the dashboard and drop that in and like start using it right away. It's just, First of all, it's integrated with our tools. We made it pluggable, but you at least need to write plugins for the things you need. Now, we, when we started this, we kind of thought, oh, there could be community plugins for this and that, and like get com the community to build out the tools that the community uses more often than like we would use. And, and maybe that will happen, but I mean, if there's certain things that you guys think could improve Agar or, or DevShop or anything, then like, let's talk because we've already built it. I'm more than happy to, to toss code out there that, that would make your tool better. I mean, you're approaching it from the right angle, meaning like the plugins and like really breaking it down to its core components, so that's cool. Uh, would you elaborate on the deploy form, like what's happening? Yeah, so. The scenes? Would you split back to it? So yeah, sure. Well, Sorry, I'm not very PowerPoint proficient. All right, so essentially, what's happening behind the scenes here, there we go. Um, so everything, like, so we have a plugin for our, our CD system. And what we do is we have a form and we have a few API endpoints um, that we open in kind of the, what I'll call the framework. And then we implement in the plugin the form part, the submit part. So the form is actually created in the generic module, but then there's a class in the interface for the plugin that says define deploy changes form. So whatever like parameters you need for your system to deploy, you can define them in your plugin. And you don't have to define the whole form, you're just defining like this middle section um, here. So like these are, 
you know, those are all things that are specific that, that we have, that we set parameters on the payload based upon that. And then when you hit the button, there's a submit function. That calls the submit function, should probably go back to where it's being recorded. Um, so that calls the submit function in the generic form, but then that just calls the plugin form that you have. So, like, everything that happens is in the plugin, but the, the core kind of framework of that is. So then in the submit function, my plugin knows what I have to do. It knows I have to send it to a certain service, so it does that. And then it gets, you know, the response and does whatever it needs to do. Um, so what is this one going to do? This one is going to call out to our uh, CD system, send the pay in the payload what, whatever I check or don't check here, and that essentially our continuous delivery system knows, all right, now we're going to build our system. So they're going to build, build the site and push it out to Acquia and deploy it. So the branch source is the branch, the destination is the environment? Uh, yes, the destination is the environment. So, I mean, essentially these are all like, you know, if I, I'm on dev, those are going to be dev stages. More just a confirmation of those. Um, so this is specifically, that's specifically written to interact with your CD system? Yes, because that's the plugin. Which is? Right, which is our Edison CD, which is based on Iron IO. Okay. So, like, if you wanted, like, uh, you know, like, whatever, whatever CI tool that you want, You'd create a plugin and then just define what parameters you require to know what to build, how to build it, and then on the submit, you would whatever action that needs to take, you would just call it there. And it's so we also open the plugin as a field on the environment. So like if you have different environment or you have different sites and you're using different tools, like we're all one organization that we're building this for, so typically we use one system. But, you know, say for like an agency that has multiple different clients out there, say they want to use this tool for this site, they want to use this tool for this site, you can actually set the plugin, because the site is actually just an entity, so it's got a field on it that, um, where you can actually define what plugin that you use for your CI, for say, so. So, I mean, our goal and our thinking was, you know, deploying a site, that's a pretty generic function, right? So we built all the wiring around what it takes to do that, and then the specific things, like, it's up to you as for whatever tool that you want to build. And for, like, some of the things that are used most by the community, you know, it was our, our idea that the, there would be a, a community plugin for that, and then it could be customized and, and whatnot for, for specific use cases. Yeah, it's kind of, I see what you're saying, that it's kind of hard to show the pluggability in a bunch of screenshots. Yeah. It's just like it's one system, but really it's not. You're just, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, maybe, and, and that's a good feat. I mean, you know, maybe I should have gone through a lot more code on how it, you know. It's, I don't think it, it, Yeah, <laughs> and maybe I, I mean, and if it's something you're interested in, I'm happy we can open up a, you know, PHP Storm and I can show you kind of how we've, we, we've architected it. So you mentioned... Edison CD, that's the thing? Yeah, that's kind of just what we call our continuous delivery system. It's like our automation tool. So, but that's not a part of, I mean. That's what integrates in this. That's actually the plugin, I, that plugin that defines this is the plugin that we wrote for Edison CD, which is our continuous delivery. So all of it is what you're hoping to open? Yeah, uh, so we, we want to open source that too as like a separate integration tool. Um, Part of that is like the Acquia Cloud API integration, which is actually the, my colleague that works on that part of the system actually has open sourced that. Um, I don't have a link in here, but um, that's a plan too, is to op you know, not necessarily have them open source together as a package, but to you know, open source that and open source this and sure. you know, kind of put out documentation and content and talks like this and blogs about how we kind of put those two things together. But um, it's just kind of our thought anyways. Um, I just was curious about another aspect of something you talked about to switch gears. Sure. You talked about having some software, and I'm curious what form that is, on each of the sites that you're managing to expose the information about that site, like the modules that are installed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what other information is exposed in there, 
I mean, if there's any limitations, is that a module or something else? Yeah, so essentially that's just a module that we, we include in our Edison base um, that gets pulled into every site, and it's just an API. And there's configuration or in settings in there that points to the API that we have um, in our in our dashboard here, um, and that our dashboard knows about the API endpoints on that side too. There's obviously some authentication um, back and forth to ensure that you know it's just these two systems that talk to each other. But essentially, it's just a module with an API, and they talk to each other, and you can literally send it any information you want. Um, we pull out lots and loads of information. We literally send back every single, not just Drupal module, but PHP package and version, which is really easy to find through Composer, and we send that back. That way we know what's out there. Um, because a lot of times what we have, we're a problem with so many sites is, you know, there's a lot of sites, some of our bigger sites, they're active all the time. They're constantly getting updates. They're constantly getting attention. But then there are some sites that there was a project and it's been sitting out there for two years. Well, like right now, we don't have any way of knowing like what version of things are like, are there security updates? If it's two years old, I guarantee you there's security vulnerabilities in there. How do you handle that? Um, one of the things I didn't really touch upon, but um, is our end goal is with this is also push platform updates. So for exactly that case, like that site's two years old, no one's touched it, we need to update it. We're gonna update it with a brand new version of everything. Now, uh, that <laughs> we thought it was gonna be tough and we actually have a system that will do that. I've successfully pushed platform updates to, to multiple sites. Um, it's drastically harder than we thought it would be, and we thought it would be hard. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration there. So we actually kind of have to rethink and retool a little bit about how we're gonna do that, but we have kind of the base idea. But having that module there that can communicate with our dashboard and can give us the information that we need to know what we need to know about that. But I mean, there's no limit to what you want to put. Like I said, we made that pluggable too. So, um, so here, so each one of these is a plugin, right? And that plugin has certain things and the plugin can also determine the storage. So right now, most of what we have is stored in Drupal entities, but you can also store it, like you can store stuff on S3. You can, you want to store things in a NoSQL database. You can do that. You know, like there are no limits, you know, because you can implement whatever you want in there. So any information you want to send back, you could do so. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're looking for things that are useful, I think that one is really useful. It sounds like it's componentized enough to, to release it as open source. Yeah, but the problem with that is, is it requires the dashboard, right? Mm -hmm. Or else, Even just having yeah. the API endpoints being available on each of those sites, then you know you could take that from there. Yeah, it it, it could be. Yeah. And we could too, is it, is it is the site itself, like the module that's running on the site exposes an API that your dashboard calls to get the information? Yes. And that spits out like JSON or something? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that and it's both ways. So it also knows about the dashboard. So it can say, hey, I'm going to send you data. Right. And then dashboard could be like, well, I haven't gotten data in a while. I need data right now to see your fresh look. I can pull it. So it's kind of a two-way API there. Right. So that could be handy on its own, right? So I think we all need that right so now as a client server. Yeah. Just, to, yeah. just exactly. two modules. Yeah. yeah. Pull that out as two independent modules. Don't need any. I mean, I have. 50 yeah. I mean, if that's something that would be helpful for the people, and these are. This is kind of why I wanted to have this talk, yeah. right? Because I don't know what's useful to us because I only know what I've been doing for three years, which is stick my head into this. So the client, do you have client modules for all the Drupal versions? Uh, no, just for Drupal, uh, Drupal 8. I don't know if they have something for Drupal 7 or not, but um, I've only worked on one for 8, so it's I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's all Composer, right? So all probably isn't any D7 stuff? Or? Um, it, I mean, in this system, everything I've talked about here is exclusively D8. Okay. We, we, we kind of built this from the ground up for D8. So, um, yes, everything is, compo Composer is absolutely fantastic. You can, you can use Composer for D7 just so. You can, yes. <laughs> it just seems like it's not possible. Awesome. You can. And we do. We, we use Composer Manager module and, and stuff, but. Yeah. 
I mean, just, yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah I would so, definitely consider pulling just those two out. I mean, that would be simple, right? Because that's just a, what you kind know. Of, does, you have some kind of UI for this, seeing this data in the modules? Um, so right now, um, so that's this. Most of, oh, okay. most of this here is, um, we haven't done a ton of work on like a way to do this. We also have different views for um, the modules and the packages. So you can sort and you can do lots of different things. I guess we're, we're almost out of time, but, um, you know, essentially it's displayed here. Um, so you can see that and... Where do we find out more? <laughs> <laughs> um, Since it's not, it's not a website that's right? Yeah, it, you know, it, it's, I, I guess, long? yeah, uh, you know, you could ping me, I guess. Um, I, I don't really have a great answer for, for that question, but I guess, you know, if you're gonna coming where, soon. If you're gonna announce, if you're gonna open Twitter. Source, where will announce I would, if I'm gonna announce anything, I'm gonna do an open source. It would be on Twitter. I don't tweet much, but if I'm gonna open source any of this, I'll, I'll absolutely make sure I put that out there, and um, I'll, I'll make sure to blog about. You can check App Innovation's blog. I don't blog there often, but um, you know, you never like know. See, I, I may want to do this now, you know, <laughs> with all my free time. He's a good guy. <laughs> so. Um, all right, I guess that's the hour. Thank you guys for attending.